a very sexist society. And if we ever question that, all we need to say is, why isn't there equal pay for equal work in a capitalistic culture? And once we say there isn't, because why? You tell me. I've been interviewed many times about why there's no equal pay for equal work. It's just blatant discrimination against women. Hi, friends. This is Read and Write with Natasha podcast. My name is Natasha Tynes, and I'm an author and a journalist. In this channel, I talk about the writing life, review books, and interview authors. Hope you enjoy the journey. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Read and Write with Natasha. Today, I have with me Susan Shapiro Barash, who has written over a dozen nonfiction books, including Tripping the Prom Queen, Toxic Friends, and You're Grounded Forever, in addition to this steamy one, A Passion for More. Uh, And uh, for more than 20 years, she has taught gender studies at Marymount Manhattan College, and has guest taught creative nonfiction at the Writing Institute at Sarah Lawrence College. Wow, Susan, hi. Uh, Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Of course. I'm so excited to uh, meet you and talk about uh, this book, which I read most of it. Uh, I just went through the stories. And so this book, for anyone who's listening or watching, um, it is um, called A Passion for More, Affairs That Make or Break. So it is a book about women having affairs. So, Susan, why did you write this book? Well, this is actually, Natasha, a 30-year study on female infidelity. I began it in the early 90s. And I was intrigued by how convention-bound women in our culture are having affairs. And I kept the study going, interviewing a diverse group of women in terms of age and race and ethnicity, level of education, um, level of you know social strata, and where they live in the country, from big towns and cities, suburbs, rural areas to see how they felt about marriages and as the research progressed about committed long-standing monogamous relationships and the lover. And what was so striking is that so many women are engaging in some sort of extramarital or extra committed relationship affair. Okay. So... Do you think women having an affair is a taboo compared to men having an affair? And is if that's the case, would that ever change? The, you mean the judgments? Uh, Correct. Women in our culture? Correct. Like women would be judged uh, harshly, more harshly if they have an affair than when men have an affair because women are seen as this motherly kind of uh, uh, loving good girls good the girls good, exactly yeah. that do not think much about sexual pressure they're too occupied with raising the kids and running the household to worry about that part of their life yes i think that the judgments against women are harsh as you said and ongoing in a very patriarchal culture and what's so fascinating about female infidelity is that it's really a choice for women just as it's been for men, and that women do it very carefully. They are very good at keeping the secret. They don't get caught unless they would Mm -hmm. like to use it as a negotiating tool to fix the marriage or committed relationship. And they're very good at balancing their lives. So in fact, based on my study, women have affairs for four different reasons. They do it for empower, you know, for empowering affairs, empowerment. They do it for self-esteem, sort of like turning 40 or 50 or 60 and looking in the mirror and saying, how many good years do I have left? And is this all there is? They do it for sex, which is reflective of what we assume about men in our culture. And they do it because they unexpectedly fall in love with someone else, which is the most poignant type of affair in my study. Do you think 
these are the same reasons men have an affair or is for women that's different? Well, first I should say that I don't interview men. So the only way that I, for any of my okay. fiction, nonfiction, so the only way that I can report men is as the women whom I do interview report men to me. Okay. So, you know, based on assumptions and information, anecdotal information from celebrity culture to historical references to everyday lives. Oh, and definitely the screen and literature. We're looking at men who do it for whatever reason they want. As um, Bill Clinton said about Monica Lewinsky, he did it because he could, I paraphrase, but something like that was the message. However, women do it for the four reasons that I cited, and that is based on my speaking to, in the aggregate for this particular book, thousands of women. Okay, so when and if, if men find out about their the, their wives or their partners' affairs, do they tend to, quote-unquote, forgive them the same way many women do that? Like, you know, the Stand By Your Man song, you know, that Hillary Clinton <laughs> quoted. Uh, so what is the men's reaction usually? Well, what I'm hearing from the women interviewees is that men are different today. And that, you know, there's no longer, and let's remember that men wrote these novels, you know, Madame Bovary, yeah. Robert had to drink yeah. poison, and Tolstoy had Anna Karenina jump in front of a train. You know, no one's doing that for sure. So women have more power, more agency, more authority. And so they're acting differently about the affairs than ever before. And they feel very entitled to the affair. And 90% of my interviewees told me that they were really guilt-free, hmm. that they did not feel guilty about the affairs. The woman did not feel guilty. They don't feel guilty. Why is that? I, like, I would assume women would carry a bigger guilt uh, than men. Right. Well, the reason that I believe the women feel little guilt or no guilt 90% of my interviewees is because by the time that they've embarked on the affair, they have endured a great deal in the primary relationship and they're very disappointed and they're not uh, getting what they want. So like if your husband is an intellectual, then maybe your lover is a bodybuilder or vice versa. Uh, or if you, you know, no one says to my husband and my lover remind me of each other. I don't hear that because they're looking for a very different experience. And and how do women have affairs from, like, where do they meet these men? I mean, do they actually seek them out, like using apps and technology, or they just happen to find them, like meet them around? Well, some women actively seek them out, but a lot of it is, as we might say, organic, meaning women are out and about. It could be the workplace. It could be your child's soccer game where you meet a father who might or might not be married himself. It could be a college reunion, a high school reunion, um, going back home for a weekend to your hometown after many years, just with the internet saying, wow, I wonder what happened to good old Joe researching him and then sort of feeling that pang. But a lot of it is really about what the women want and how they go after it. And to that end, when this book came out again just recently and, you know, with the updated, revised information and new and new interviews, um, I Heart Podcast optioned it for a podcast that came out from February to April called She Wants More, based on a passion for more. And in that, I, because of your question, I just thought of this, in that podcast, they entered one of the women, and these were the real women speaking, of course, changing identifying characteristics. Yeah. If the name is Sarah, it's not really Sarah, you know, in the podcast or in my book. But what was interesting, Natasha, is that um, one of the women spoke about being on 
Ashley Madison's website okay. where it really is about having an affair, you know, overtly, deliberately when you are already in a committed relationship or a marriage. So one of those women talked about that and that she ended up falling in love with the lover. So that was an interesting story. Huh. Another way to meet the men. Interesting. So um, in, in one of, uh, I think, your findings in the book, you said that some affairs actually improve the marriage. Can you elaborate in, on that? Yeah. So the way that the affair improves the marriage or monogamous relationship is that the women are getting from the lover what they don't get from their husband or longstanding partner. So if there's very little sex in the primary relationship, there's a lot of sex with the lover. If um, there's really no excitement, there's no, some of the women say, going out to wonderful restaurants and taking long walks, whatever is missing. Um, a lot of women talk about how much they can communicate and be understood by the lover in a way that they're not by their husband or partner. Is there a common thread on what women seek in 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 a lover or in affairs what like you know if you want to answer the question what do women want what are they seeking what are they mostly seeking that they don't have in a committed relation many of the women say that they feel important to the lover and they feel invisible or almost invisible in the marriage or primary relationship And so they're saying that they feel so appreciated and admired and understood and as if they're really counting, as if they are really meaningful to this man. And when there are little children, because the other thing I want to say is that women of all ages have affairs from their 20s to their 80s, which is just fascinating to me at these different stages of their lives and of the relationship that they've been, you know, invested in. So the, the women are saying that they feel like they count. I see. And so your book, you know, it's it's fascinating, but I'm, I'm sure some people find it a bit controversial. So I, I, I want to ask you about first, how did you publish it? Did you have to find an agent? What was your publishing journey? Well, this book has come, this is the third edition. Okay. It came out in 1993, and then it came out in 2001, and then it came out this just you know this year. So, so this book and my ongoing research has really been illuminating. And I've been with three different publishers for you know for each issue is a different publisher. Why is that? The, so the the second and the third time publishers came to me, and and I you know this is. I've published 17 books. This is my newest book, which I hope I can mention later. Sure, yeah. That just came out, like, you know, three weeks ago. So the point is, is that for my fiction and nonfiction, over the years, I have been with different publishers. And each experience has been quite terrific. And I've always had an agent and representation. Okay. Yes, this, uh, but the point that you made a minute ago is that's really, I think, significant is that this is still a controversial topic Correct. yeah and that it's still it's it reminds us of how patriarchal a culture we live in and how much bias against women really still exists and i kept thinking it would get better with time the women's voices get stronger the when i did my first edition the women were from say late 20s to early or mid 50s and with this last study especially during covid including affairs of the mind you know not just physical affairs and cyberspace affairs i was hearing from women in their early 80s i was oh, hearing wow. from young women who were engaged or about to move in with a partner who were having it affair it was really really intriguing to me so and the reason i ask about the book what so what was the reaction that you got from readers 
And I'm sure that there were positive and negative. So did you have negative reaction to the book? Oh, I, there's always been pushback on female infidelity because okay. you had mentioned that I've written 13 nonfiction books and I did three studies on the role of the wife. Okay. I've written three, three books on wifing and, and marriage in America and affairs, uh, and that's separate from a, a passion for more. And in each of these books, I've looked at the life of the wife and heard more about affairs. And so, again, you know, the women feel as if it's a form of agency okay, and a way to understand themselves. It's almost like self-care. And our culture is still very puritanical and, frankly, very sexist. So it will always be, I think, or at least for the near future as well, an incendiary topic. What kind of negative feedback did you get? Did you get any like negative reviews from readers saying, you know? No, more just anecdotally or when okay. I was out on a book tour. Okay. And people would say, why is this happening? And who are these women? And it's happening because women hold the bar very high in these marriages and committed relationships and aren't really happy as I said earlier, no, I don't believe anyone walks down the aisle saying, gee, I wonder when I'll have my first affair. It's more that it's the experience and life of the actual marriage or committed relationship that yields a woman who is open to an affair. We also live a very long time. And longevity really adds to this, you know, curiosity and longing for someone else. Do you think women with children, like mothers, are judged more than women without children? Do I think it happens more with women who have children? Do you think they are judged more than women without children? Do you think the mother figure... I don't know about more, but I would say definitely judgments against and of women are pervasive absolutely pervasive that as i said earlier this is a very sexist society and if we ever question that all we need to say is why isn't there equal pay for equal work in a capitalistic culture and once we say there isn't because why you tell me i've been interviewed many times about why there's no equal pay for equal work it's just blatant discrimination against women and it hasn't it's gotten better. It is not equal. And if we take that as the premise, then of course women are judged more harshly. Of course women are held to a different standard. And then that circles back to what we said a few minutes ago about being the good girl and being a pleaser and being a mother and being a wife. And all of this connotes purity Mm. and commitment. And men were always allowed, you know, wink, wink, to travel, have something on the side. And women now trade in the same currency. Women travel for business. They have a business credit card. They have cell phones. I can't tell you how many women in this study, when they started an affair, got a different kind of phone just to get in touch with the lover. You could be lying next to your husband on the couch watching Netflix and texting your lover. You know, social media technology makes it easier. But when I started this study and it wasn't a big part of the picture, the women were every bit as compelled. You said something that uh, was fascinating, that women are more careful than men when it comes to hiding their affairs. I had um, conducted a study in in 2008, it came out, called Little White Lies, Deep Dark Secrets, The Truth About Why Women Lie. And of course, again, affairs were part of the, you know, big bag of secrets and lies for women. And women are very facile at juggling, as I said earlier, at keeping everything going in their lives. When you live and die in a patriarchy and you're female, you have honed your skills. So you're pretty multifaceted and you're pretty capable of a lot of things going on at once. 
So women who have high power jobs, women who have three little children, women who have a mother-in-law to take care of and a mother to take care of and little children and a husband, somehow all these stories can still be added to with an affair. It's really for the woman, it is a very specific conscious choice. Wow. So if someone comes to you and, and tells you, you know, this is against religion, all religion, and uh, by writing this book, you you might be encouraging women to have affairs. What would you say to them? I neither condemn nor condone. This okay. is a journalistic endeavor. I am here to report a slice of life for more women than we think. Okay. And... And you say that to anyone who comes forward with with that allegation? Yes. For anyone who asks me if I'm endorsing this, I'm noting it. It's been a study of mine for all these years. I started this research because many years ago, I was taking the commuter train into New York City. And I was sitting beside four women, you know, facing in the car. They're facing each other. And they were... One of them was about to get married in two weeks, and she was confessing that she was still seeing her old boyfriend. And I thought, wow, I was married, a very young wife with young kids. And I thought, wow, that's worth eavesdropping (laughs) and, you know, to, to listen to more. And then, weirdly, when I got to the birthday lunch, friends were talking about their friends and affairs. And, and I thought, is this in the ether? Is this a trend, a phenomenon? Is it a one-off? What is it? And so because I am a journalist, I wanted to know more. It was so long ago that I put ads in newspapers across the country and put a hotline into my home office and just heard from women who kept saying, well, thank God you're writing this book. I don't feel so alone now. And, you know, by the time I did my latest research, I could post on the internet to find interviewees. But for every woman whom I spoke with, I always asked her if she had a friend or knew someone. I ended up interviewing military wives. I just really, as I told you earlier, a very disparate, diverse group of women. And um, the longing for the lover is what's so palpable. Wow. So I want to talk about Literature, and you mentioned Anna Karenina, and uh, um, the other one is Madame. Yeah, Uh, what about more contemporary literature? I know there is one. I think Little Children. um, If you if you know that by Tom Perota. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, was, um, a film as well. What other that that portrays it in a manner? Because if, like I read that book a few years ago, and for me it was still unique because it was from the woman's perspective and how the ending and all of that. So I was wondering, where is literature, special fiction, when it comes to talking about women's affairs? Where are we now from the days of Anna Karenin? Not as dire. Okay. But still with great risk, I'm thinking of fiction. Well, first of all, I'm thinking, of, although, again, it's an old book, you know, it's really classic literature, but it was written by a woman and everyone else that you cited are male writers interpreting this. And that would be The Awakening by Kate Chopin. Okay. But, but even in that, you know, it's a, a very sad end. And I myself... And now I can mention my new novel. Of course, which is yeah. My pen name, Maribel Shadow by Susanna Marin, my favorite name. So this has an affair in it. And it, and it was really, for me, great to write about this character in the affair. And she's a young woman. She has a little boy. Her name is Raleigh. And what the lover meant to her and how drawn she was to him. And of course, the risk reward of these affairs is written about in more contemporary books. But there is always something in our culture around an affair that makes us gas. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you remember the film that came out, I would say 10 or 15 years ago with Diane Lane and um, 
Richard Gere called Unfaithful, where um, Maybe. Yeah. she's married to Richard Gere. So, of course, we say uh, to ourselves. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Well, if you're married to Richard Gere, you really need to have an affair, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, it, and it also has a sad ending, no? Was it? Tragic. tragic. Yeah, I remember, I remember. Yeah. This affair are so, and in my own novel, the affair really, in this new novel, spins and spins this woman. So I'm not here to say there aren't repercussions. I'm here to say that many women today, in particular, based on my research these last few years, are really looking at it as a very personal journey. I see. It's not, it's not about oh, the husband versus the lover. It's about what this woman's needs are and what resonates with the lover that can't be found in the marriage or, or longstanding relationship. Huh. There was a recent HBO documentary. Uh, what was it called? Love and Lies or something. It's a, a true story about a woman in Texas who has an affair with her Neighbor. What is it called? I'm going to try to see it. It's called Love and Lies. Uh, HBO. HBO. Hold on. Let me see. HBO. Love. Uh, uh, lo- love and Death. Love and oh, Death. Love and Death. Oh wow. It's right. based on a true story. Uh, right. Uh, and the and the woman is still alive that they base the story on, uh, and it it starts with her having an affair and and the repercussions of, of what happened. Right. Um, and it really is, you know, I'm not here to say it's for everyone. I'm here to say that it is happening more and more than we think. And I do include, an, as I mentioned, an affair of the mind and um, workplace affairs and finding that old flame, all sorts of reasons that trigger women. But we're really looking at female longing. And what is it about women? And, and we live a long time and we reinvent ourselves along the way. And women are very disappointed by relationships. Yeah. And how well do we know ourselves when we make a commitment? And who is the lover that you would risk so much to have that experience? So, you know, these are the realities of affairs. Do you think men are to blame for women having affairs? Do I think that men are to blame for men having affairs? I don't know if to blame, but based on all of my research on how women really feel, you know, versus the faces we wear, the hats we wear, the the pleasers who we are, I would think that disappointment is a big part of why women do what they do, and that would include affairs. They're disappointed in the marriage. That's why when I said the most poignant part of my study is the love affairs, because I interviewed women who say life is just fine. My husband, it's good enough. We have these kids together. Some women say we have these grandchildren together. And then that lover walks across the room somewhere, somehow, and it changes everything. It's what we would call a thunderbolt. And that's something to consider in the life of a woman, that, you know, nothing is contained just because we put one foot in front of the other doesn't mean that we'll get the result that we expect. Life is full of surprises for women. Hmm. I think, is it more of a, I know you said, you know, you interviewed people in, different ages, but do you think mostly it can be defined as a midlife crisis? I thought that a lot of women turning 40 in my initial phase of research years ago were looking in the mirror and saying, how many good years do I have left? And all I do is take care of these children. And, you know, the second shift, I have, a you know, the proverbial second shift in our culture where women are working but they come home and they still do the lunch boxes and the homework and get the kids bathed. And, you know, if they're young and ready for school the next day, you know, is this all there is? And my husband watching the football game and with the clicker, you know, the remote control, and is that all there is? And how long will I look good? I think that happened more at the age of 40 years ago, but as longevity has increased for women, 
And women are more powerful in their own realms, within their friendships, their communities. And they, you know, and I've interviewed women who, you know, start new positions at the age of 60. I've interviewed women who move away from their children and grandchildren to have a new life. So we're looking at women who just wake up and say, this is what I need after all these years of sacrifice or some say they were martyrs. And I'm not sure how much that plays into the affair, but certainly the idea that they want more as the podcast is called, She Wants More. Wow. Can you tell me a, a bit about the, the podcast? Um, so they, yeah. ap- they approached you. How, how did that happen? So I was approached by um, producers okay. and they, and they optioned to my book and it was taken to iHeart podcast. Okay. And they chose a really impressive host who had had a few podcasts going at iHeart. One was called Committed and she's an author as well. And we really all worked so well together. Her name is Joe Piazza and she was the host. And I would love for you to listen to it. Oh, yes, yeah. I'm going to listen to I it today. Yeah. The way that she interviewed to be so impressive. And I loved, I loved the women and I loved Joe as the host. She was fantastic. Wow. And what was the reaction to the, to the podcast? The podcast did well. It did really well. And I heard from people and they heard from people and it was written up and Joe was interviewed. I was interviewed, interviewed when the book came out. I was on Good Day New York and um, written up in the New York Post and lots of like fan mail, you know, emails and to the website and yeah, like a real reaction. And always the interest in how women are positioned in society. And c- can we listen to it in, in any pl- uh, on any platform or only iHeartRadio? On any pl- platform. Okay. So is there any uh, plans to turn it into a documentary? I would love for it to be a documentary. Um, I would love for it to even be traumatized. I'm, you know, always interested yeah. in, in this aspect of a woman's life. Yeah, I think as a follow-up to the HBO do- um you know, kind of show that's based on a real life, maybe. Oh, the life and the love and death. Love and death. I mean, there's, you know, I would try to capitalize on the success of that show by pitching uh, your book as a as a show. That's just an idea. Oh, thank um, you. So, what is your day to day like? Do you write every day? Do you teach? How is how is life for Susan Shapiro and why did you choose a pen name when you write fiction? So d- since the, since COVID, I haven't taught at Marymount. And okay. it's like after 23 years. And it's been amazing to be a full-time writer. And I'm working on a nonfiction proposal and a new novel. And this book, Susanna Marin, um, is my pen for my fiction. This is my fourth novel. I chose to have a pen name, really my publisher, St. Martin's at the time of my first novel called Between the Tides that came out in 2015, they asked me if I wanted a pen name to differentiate my fiction from my nonfiction. And I said, totally. Because when I was in my second year of college, many years ago, and my parents came to visit me, I said to my mother, listen, I have to have a pen name. I, you know, I'm going to be writing these books and like, I just can't be called Susan Shapiro. Susan Rona Shapiro, and she said, no, you can't do that. Why not? Because she thought long and hard about my name, which sounded really weird because she didn't come up with such a great name for that thinking. And um, I said, but I have the name. I want to take the A from Rona and make it Susanna, and I want to use the family name as the last name. And because I was a good girl and a pleaser, when she said no, I said, okay, fine. And then all those years later, St. Martin's asked my agent if I wanted a pen name, and I said, I have the pen name. Here it is. So they added the H to Susanna and they spelled Marin this way. Mm -hmm. And they just also, I think for fiction, it's important, I think, to have a sort of melodic name. And let's face it, Susanna Marin is prettier than Susan Shapiro Barish. But don't you think that you already built a brand with 
you know, Susan Shapiro, and you need that brand to also sell fiction books. Or I, no? Yeah, it was a little tough. I remember getting to a library where I was asked to speak when Between the Tides came out. And when I got there, the librarian said, Susan, and I said, yes. And she said, oh, I thought you were someone named Susanna Marin. She said, if I had known it was you, I would have filled this room mm. right away. That's you know, so it was like starting over. Yeah. But it's worked out and I'm happy to have it. And there are a lot of writers who have pen yeah. names. Yeah, that's true. So, and I mean, beyond Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens. J.K. Rowling. <laughs> Rachel Cook goes by Robert Gulp. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For her job. yeah. And I know Joyce Carol Oates has, I can't remember. I, I thought it was like Rosemary Kelly, but don't quote me. Something okay. like one of okay. her so you spend all your day writing and reading, pretty much. Well, I do have other commitments and family commitments, but I do try to write every day, and I read every day. How many hours? Just curious. Hours. Like, um, I'm doing an event soon, but when I get back, I'll write all afternoon into evening. Wow. And I have another podcast <laughs> for, for Maribel Shadow. So, you know, it, I'm also now on a book tour, you know, for Maribel Shadow, and I toured for the reissue of A Passion for More over the winter. So it's been a really busy time to be out there as well. But who's the publisher of the of the new book? This is both of uh, Maribel Shadow. Yeah, for both for it's been great. Okay. I really like them. I love the jacket. Okay, I think yeah, really I like new. it. Yeah, yeah, it's very nice. I'll send you one. Yeah, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Wow, um, fascinating. I mean, um, you know, you, you're living the dream. I mean, I'm, that's what I'm doing now, reading and writing um, every day and, and podcasting, but, uh, you know, not to your level, but, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I want to be you. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, so what's in the future for both Susanna and Susan? I'm working on a new novel, um, and I'm working on a new nonfiction project. So it's really busy interviewing women, always, always curious about how women really feel. Is there going to be another edition for Passion for More? No, but it, of course we'll have all my books sort of dovetail. You know, I wrote a book on sisters years ago, an ongoing study called Sisters Devoted or Divided. And actually, this is the story of three adult sisters and their mother. Ah, and within cool. the first few pages, Maribel's handsome young husband dies unexpectedly. And it's all about who did what and what the lies are and where once Samuel's gone. Hmm. And I'm very interested in the role of wife, obviously, in our society. So I'm really looking at how Maribel and her sisters are as wives and sisters. So, you know, each of my studies, I did a book on mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law. I wrote a book on second wives. I wrote a book about female rivalry called Tripping the Prom Queen. So I'm looking at all these aspects of the female journey. So which of these books uh, sold the most? Oh, that's a good question. Passion for More has done really well. They've all done pretty well. I know Tripping the Prom Queen did really well, a book called Toxic Friends. About female friendships did really well. A book called You're Grounded Forever, but first let's go shopping about mothers and daughters, the book on sisters that I mentioned. And so I take my nonfiction and I really put the research into the characters and plots of my fiction. Wow. So, you know, these characters are pretty multidimensional and also I feel reflective of how women navigate a path. Hmm. Last question is, is what are you reading these days? Uh, what am I reading? I just bought a book. Well, first of all, I just finished The Golden Doves by Martha Hall Kelly. And I read Hello Beautiful mm. by Nia Palatino. Yeah. And Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. I just read all those in the last month. I okay. read about a book a week. Love to. And then. I always um, love to read and reread the classics. So I just reread The Custom of the Country in May by Edith Wharton. So that's where I'm at. 
Wow. So do you have any tips or advice for anyone who wants to be a full-time writer like you? For a long time, I had a day job too. I would say keep your day job, write when you can, make no excuses. Don't say, oh, I'm tired from work. I'm tired from this. I'm tired. My kids wore me out. My friends wear me out. My husband wears me out. No, 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 no. You write or you won't be happy. So if you're a true writer, you get up at 5.30 in the morning or you eat a faster dinner or you and you make the time and that way you have your pages. I recommend writing because for writers, if you don't write, it's like denying yourself something so essential. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Any any parting words before we conclude this fascinating discussion? I love to hear from fans. So definitely, you know, get in touch through the website. And thank you so much for having me on. Of course. Uh, and your books are available on Amazon, the bookstore, and your website is Susan Shapiro. Uh, either Susan Shapiro Barish.com or Susanna Marin.com. It'll bring you to the same person. Thank you very much. And for anyone who's listening or watching, thank you for joining us today. And until we meet again.